everybody for uh, joining us for today's discussion on new sustainability and tech regulation. The first in a series of uh, events by our new information policy lab here at UCLA, which is produced uh, by the UCLA Institute for Technology, Law and Policy. My name is Michael Karanikolas. I'm the executive director of the UCLA Institute for Technology, Law and Policy. I'll begin by acknowledging UCLA's presence on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielle and Otongo peoples. Um, we are planning to set aside some time for Q&A and audience engagement at the end, so feel free to plug your questions and comments into the chat. And I will also start with a quick plug that this is the first event in a series um, focusing on media perspectives. Um, the next event is going to focus more on platform perspectives, um, and that's going to be uh, September 21st, and I will uh, put a link to the registration for that in the chat below. We have a fantastic panel to um, discuss the issue today. Danielle Coffey is Executive Vice President and General Counsel for the News Media Alliance, which represents 2,000 news media outlets worldwide. Uh, Matthew Ingram is a Chief Digital Writer for the Columbia Journalism Review, where he writes about the intersection of media and technology. Uh, Julia Angwin is a Pulitzer Prize winning American investigative journalist, New York Times bestselling author, and founder and editor at large of The Markup, a nonprofit newsroom that investigates the impact of technology on society. And our moderator for today is uh, Courtney Raj, resident fellow here at ICLP. Very much looking forward to this conversation. Courtney, over to you. Uh, great. Well, thanks so much, Michael. And thank you to our panelists. I'm really excited about this conversation since as many of you who know me or anyone on this panel, um, this is what we work on every day. And I think that one of the most interesting things that we can examine today is the intersection of technology policy, media sustainability, and journalistic freedom. Because of course, we all know the coronavirus infodemic, the proliferation of disinformation and manipulation of elections, the rise of authoritarianism. I mean, the list goes on and on all of which are fundamentally impacted and shaped by journalism and by uh, the importance of fact-based journalism and reporting to our public health, to our democracies and political systems, to accountable governance, even when you don't live in a democracy. And so I'm really delighted to be here uh, joined with some of the foremost experts who are really following this uh, issue, both as journalists, in the case of Matthew and Julia, um, as journalists who are fundamentally impacted by the technology policies, like researcher access to data, um, platform content moderation policies, like Julia, um, who, who heads up the markup, one of the most innovative news organizations um, working right now. And then, of course, we've got Danielle Coffey from the News Media Alliance, which represents thousands of small and large media organizations around the United States and advocates um, for their interests. And so we're going to have a wide-ranging discussion today. As Michael mentioned at the outset, I would love to hear from the audience and hear your questions. So feel free to put those into the chat during this conversation and I'll try to um, integrate those throughout. And then also feel free to, um, at the end, raise your hand and we'll try to get some of those in. I'm also delighted that this is linked to the Information Policy Lab, a new course that Michael and I are teaching um, this year at UCLA Law School. And so we have several students that are researching this topic. So this is such an awesome opportunity from, for them to hear from experts like yourselves. So with that, I want to delve into, um, into this conversation by focusing in on some of the regulatory and legislative proposals to essentially make big tech pay for the news they use. So we see proposals um, to allow news media to collectively bargain licensing agreements with tech platforms. We see revisions to copyright law, as in the European Union, which has expanded copyright to include publishers. Um, but we heard from the US Copyright Law Office that we don't really need that law here in the US. Uh, we've seen efforts to tax big tech and redirect some of those profits um, to support news media, to um, rebalance through antitrust and competition laws some of the imbalances in the ad tech marketplace. So there are a plethora of proposals. We've seen some of them tried, for example, in Australia, the News Media Bargaining Code. There's a draft bill in front of Congress right now to allow collective bargaining, bargaining for news media. Um, and of course, in the EU, India, Indonesia, lots of countries are looking at what they can do to support their journalism industry. So with that, I'd like to just go quickly, maybe first to Matthew, 
and then to Julia and, and Danielle to hear about what, what are you seeing as the kind of some of the most interesting initiatives that have the potential to actually influence the sustainability of the work that we do. And if you can talk a little bit about what that work is, what you cover, and how the platforms shape the work that you do as journalists or as representing media organizations. So Matthew, I know that's a big, uh, it's a big topic, but you know, jump into it. You, you've been writing about these topics for a long time. So why don't you start us mm -hmm. off? Sure. Uh, so obviously the platforms and how they approach media and journalism is, is my whole thing. Like that's what I've been writing about since, since the things we call platforms were invented. And so it's been a real evolution, shall we say. Uh, and I think initially journalists saw platforms as you know, helpers and then that relationship soured for a whole bunch of reasons. And I think as the financial crisis, if you will, in journalism, the, the the sort of tectonic shift in how information is distributed and how it's paid for, um, as that's become more obvious and, and more sort of problematic. I think everyone, regulators, journalists, anyone with an interest has been searching for solutions. And so I think all of that makes complete sense. I you know, I, I certainly wouldn't deny that there are significant problems in, in sort of the, the existing journalism business. But I think what we've mostly got are bad solutions. Um, I don't think, you know, I can, I can go into more detail if you want, but I don't think, I think the EU's approach is wrongheaded in a bunch of ways. And I think the, um, the bill that Congress is looking at, the journalistic competition protection uh, act is is also fundamentally flawed. So, can you the can impulse you a, behind can you talk them? A little I think bit about sense. why. Sorry, Matthew. I just can you can you give a little bit more detail sure. why you think that about the JCPA or? I mean, but you, so you EU. mentioned the EU approach. I assume you mean the copyright directive, and you mentioned yeah. the Journalism Conservation and Protection Act, which is the U.S. version yeah. of the news media bargaining code. Give us a sense, just you know, what are some of the key issues that you think are kind of wrong with those approaches? <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> you have like. Um, <laughs> I think the 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 fundamental the the biggest problem, I think, is a, is a sort of existential one. I don't think the rationale behind either one of these laws or legal approaches makes any sense. I don't think it's it, it, the, the idea that, that platforms should pay for content that is willingly given to them, or that platforms should pay to link to content, which is something that everyone does on the internet every day. Though, I don't think there's any way around the fact that those that that rationale that that fundamental argument doesn't make a lot of sense. And so I think if you look at the JCPA in particular, um, there's a whole lot of sort of mumbo jumbo and kind of smoke and mirrors and 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 rhetoric designed to 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 get around the the fact that it doesn't make any sense. And so then you have a structure to force payments. Um, that has a number of problems. So there's very little transparency about where those payments are going to go. Um, the bill says that media outlets have to be transparent, but it doesn't say what they have to talk about, except that once a year, they have to say how much they got. They don't have to say where the funds went. They don't have to show that it went to journalism. It could, it could go anywhere. Um, so that's one problem. I think the, the restrictions that are I think genuinely uh, designed to, to make it uh, apply to smaller journalistic outlets are, are well-intentioned. But unfortunately that's, you know, a 1500 employee cutoff could wind up going wrong in a number of ways. Um, it's going to include some quite large entities. Um, there are other aspects of the bill that effectively allow anyone who defines themselves as a journalistic outlet and does a sort of minor amount of journalistic things 
to to become part of these negotiating groups. That could include Breitbart or or any number of right wing outlets um, who are then going to be funded to distribute misinformation. Um, that's just a few of the things that sort of leap to mind. Great, thank you for that, Matthew. Before we go to Danielle, who has been working on this legislation for, I don't even know how many years, because I remember before COVID showing, okay, four or five, like showing up in Congress. 2018. Yeah, you guys used to do some, you know, briefings on the Hill and 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 all that. We're mm -hmm. gonna come to you, but I wanna hear Julia, you are a digital native, um, you know, editor in chief of a digital native news organization. It's small but powerful. I mean, you guys have done some incredible investigative reporting, really innovative uses of platforms, and you've turned, you know, platform reporting into a beat in and of itself. Um, you know, there are, it feels like you're in kind of this interesting relationship where both you could benefit from some of these regulatory approaches, um, but on the other hand, you're also, you know, often reporting on platforms and, and critical of their approaches. So do we want to have the platforms playing an even closer, more substantial ro role in the journalism industry? So you know, I'd love to hear from you. Do you want, like, should Facebook and Google be play paying um, the markup for using snippets of your news? Should they be doing more to support journalism or does that raise red flags for you? Um, well, I'll just say right now that like, I can't imagine a world in which the markup would accept money from Facebook and Google. We, um, report so much on them. Um, but if you don't mind, I'd like to zoom out a little bit and just sort of talk about the issue facing journalism, because I think what we're talking about here are remedies. And I think remedies are always, um, about how you define the problem. So I want to sort of talk about the problem. So if you can go bear with me and just go back in time a little bit when I started in journalism, it was a very profitable profession. And that was largely because they had monopolies on their audiences right so when I worked at the San Francisco Chronicle. The way you reach people in San Francisco, you had a couple choices right the local radio station, the local TV and the local newspaper. And when I went to the Wall Street Journal, you know the only way you could reach that sort of middle aged. Um, middle manager with a BMW golfing was you bought a full page ad or half page in the Wall Street Journal for hundreds of thousands of dollars and you were able to reach that guy and that's why the journal was able to support an incredible amount of investigations and foreign bureaus and this and that. And then what happened is just to be really, really clear about it is that the online advertising model blew up that monopoly on audience and the way they did that was through surveillance right the way you find that middle-aged golfing guy now is you track him across internet using cookies and you profile him he's gone to a golf site now he's gone to a bmw site and you serve him ads for pennies fractions of a penny per view of that ad there's really no monopoly anymore on audience for these news outlets. And so just to put some stark numbers on it, you know, journalism revenues, newspaper ad revenues have fallen from 2010, $20 billion to $10 billion in 2020. So going down by half. And in that same time, online advertising soared from $31 billion to $189 billion. So that's an incredible number. And what that means is journalism is really fighting for its life. And a lot of the t discussions that are being had are essentially redistribution questions, right? Can we redistribute some of those excessive profits towards journalism? Because reality is journalism is the watchdog of democracy. I would argue that if you don't have a free press, you actually don't have a real democracy. That is what keeps governments honest, right? Because the government has to act on behalf of citizens and the citizens don't have time to police all this stuff. And so we are their representative. And so I think it's a very important question. How do you fund this when the model doesn't work anymore? And so I think the problem with, I, I'm sure that 
um, you know, these criticisms are correct about all these different solutions. But I think that at a philosophical level, we have to figure out, does it make sense? Do we want to force those tech companies who have excessive profits to fund journalism? Or is there going to be some other way, right? Because the government could fund it or we could, I don't know, try to convince a bunch of private donors to do it. Um, but there does need to be some funding for it. And I think one thing that's really hard for journalism is that these platforms are our main competitors, right? They literally are competing with us for advertising and they're our distributors. So imagine if you were um, in the old days, if you if the newsstand that you paid to put your news or magazine on was also competing with you for advertising. I mean, that's the weird world that journalism now operates in. And it's one that is extremely difficult. And so I guess I just want to put it out there that the question of whether the redistribution of profits is something we want to do as a society is one that I think almost has to be answered before we get to the how. I, I agreed. Um, but I would say that lots of democracies have answered that with a yes. And so now we see a variety of different hows. Some is through um, you know, making big tech platforms pay licensing fees for the use of news snippets. Um, other efforts are aimed at breaking up some of that, um, you know, vertical and horizontal integration among the platforms and the various roles they play in the ecosystem, um, you know, various antitrust interventions. You mentioned that the markup would never take money from tech platforms with good reason. They're who you cover. It's a pretty standard journalistic practice. But what about the idea of, you know, simply someone uses your content, right? The, the licensing fee is that this product uses your content to fuel. Um, so on the one hand, that's fueling their business product. On the other hand, it's probably driving traffic to your website. Do you have a sense of where the markup might come down on that? Like, do you ultimately, you know, get more from that referral traffic? Do you think it would make it any difference to you to receive licensing payments? I mean, look, all payments would make a difference. We are in the business of collecting <laughs> as much money as we can. But um, I think, I mean, first of all, I just want to say, like, I am not um, the CEO of the markup. They're, the business side of the markup has their own views about things. And so just to be clear that I'm not the decider on that. But as the founder and the vision for the markup, I would say that, like, I don't think it makes sense for small outlets like the markup to try to negotiate directly with those big platforms. I mean, when um, that wonderful article that Bill Gruskin did about how um, Australia, all the outlets in Australia are trying to negotiate with the big tech platforms and the small ones really had no hope, right? And so I don't think that a system that just sets it up as a like everyone has to just figure this out in free market contracts doesn't work for small outlets. And I think that there is a decent model out there where um, companies, I mean, countries put together like a sovereign fund that sort of hands out payments. And it does seem to me like some sort of intermediary at the very least would be needed to make this a fair process because of course, the big players can hire an army of lawyers to sit down with the incredibly well paid Facebook and Google lawyers, but like small outlets can't do that. And this doesn't seem like the right way to do it. And I also would just like to say that like, we do have an existing mechanism for collecting revenue from companies called taxes. And I don't understand why no one's talking about that. Like there could be a news tax that just sort of collects it and then it gets distributed some other way. So putting it into this weird, like everyone gets in a cage and like mud wrestles with Facebook for the money just doesn't seem to me like the optimal solution. Great. Well, that is the perfect transition to Danielle, because I think some of the, you know, I think there's been a lot of learning from the Australia situation. We know that Canada is looking at its own bill. Um, Brazil had a similar approach uh, proposed and it got torpedoed because small independent publishers were aligned with big tech in concerns over essentially handing 
uh, handing over a big win, you know, to big media. But Danielle, you know, you've been working on this bill, you've been tweaking it, it's evolved um, to, I think, try to address some of those issues around allowing, you know, small media to collectively bargain as a as an entity so that they don't each individually have to do that. There's, you know, um, I mean, this bill, but more generally, the principle of you know, rebalancing that relationship, which, you know, I, I like to call the frenemies relationship, you know, they, they both need each other and, and, and hate each other. Um, can you address, you know, what you see as, as part of the solution and, you know, also respond to some of um, Julia's concern, you know, as a practicing journalist, you know, editor and, and um, you know, part of this, dig, you know, a small digital native news organization. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to. And thank you for having me. I think that this is a perfect, um, actually, it's an absolutely perfect time. We have the JCPA going, I don't know if you know this, to mark up tomorrow. So we are in the thick of coming up with and addressing and answering actually all the questions that were raised here. And I also really appreciate that I don't have to talk to this group about the importance of what we do, that I don't have to start from the top. I mean, also, Julia did an amazing job of going through what it is we do, what we deliver to society. And I know that Matt knows that as well. And Courtney, I'm certainly familiar with your work and that you know what we provide to our readers and communities, what happened with COVID in education, the schools opening, people covering city halls, people covering the health crisis, so on and so forth, something that no one else will do. That is the first thing I remind people up on the Hill. No one else will replace us and provide the valuable content to local communities across America like we do. That will not be replaced. So if we go away, I remember one woman once said, who I respect highly, said, you will miss us when we're gone. So if we can start from a baseline, not everybody, unfortunately, can start from that baseline, but fortunately, we can to say, okay, so now if we know we're valuable and we're more valuable than just societal value. We do, we provide an economic value. And the reason why we know we provide an economic value and that there is a direct nexus between the value we provide and the revenue that our distributors generate for themselves without return to the content creators is because we found that direct nexus, not just in the advertising revenue. I think everybody kind of gets that. There's so much evidence from the DOJ and others in the courts that we know that there's an advert broken advertising ecosystem. I think we all know that. Google and Facebook are doing pretty well. I don't think anybody would argue otherwise. But what we forget is that when our content is on their platform, it's a, their platforms, it's a walled garden. People don't leave. And that's, that's not by accident. This is not Larry, this is not 2009 where Larry Page said, you know, we want to direct the people out to where they want to be. No, 65% of users stay within the walled garden, digest AMP, digest rich photos, digest featured snippets, digest audio, digest video, and then finally you get down to organic search, what it used to be in 2009. So when the reader stays within the walled garden, it doesn't click through, and all of their data and everything they're consuming is never paid through to the, to the content creator. So when we originally gave our content to Google in the first place, it was 20 years ago, and we thought, okay, this is a fair exchange of value, right? And it seemed like that at the time when Larry Page said that a few years after we gave them our content. But that is not the case anymore. 65% of users do not click through. And when they do, they take up to 70% of the advertising revenue again, which I don't have to go into. But combined, we are not getting a fair exchange of value for our valuable content. So this notion that it's a bailout or what was... Um, or that there should be another mechanism. When there's a when there's um, a value that's transferred to another party, payment is typically in a competitive marketplace allowed to be demanded. And so when we transfer our content, we have the legal right today individually to be able to demand payment, but we can't because no one publisher can assert their right on their own. What I wanted to do real quick, if you'll allow me to do this, because I think I'd like to rebut some of the claims that were made about the, um, I think, Matt, I won't take offense, the mumbo jumbo, but those laws are actually really important and the governance and the structure by which the news content providers can be paid by these dominant platforms is actually really important, like any other compensation mechanism that exists in other um, industries, such as music, mu movies, television, what have you. 
And so the mechanism that's been created in this compensation and um, structure through the JCPA, I would just uh, I would just correct a few things just at the outset, if you if you'll allow me to do that, because I got to correct the record here, especially before it goes to markup. We're getting so many, a lot of talking points coming from our opposition. So I just attack, I just put in the chat the bill that I'm going to refer to, and I'm just going to go about one by one and make it kind of hopefully easy for folks so that they can refer to the page numbers. It says that we're supposed first. Um, it was said that we willingly give our content. That's not in the bill because I think most know that the House Majority Report evidenced the reason why there is a nexus between their taking of our content and our unwillingness to withhold our content because they are a monopoly. I think that that's, um, you know, if, if you look at the House Majority Report, the DOJ proceedings, our white paper and other materials that will establish that, I think that will help to understand that we're not willingly consenting to the use of our contents. It's more of a necessity like it is with monopolies. Then you'll see on page 25, we're not actually paying for links. So the way that Europe did it, they paid for links and snippets because it was a copyright law here. This is an antitrust law. And we're actually withholding access to our content, which is different than how the platforms will then use our content. They are not paying for any one specific use that would actually undervalue all of the uses of our content. And so they are not, in fact, paying for links. Um, as you can see on page 25, they are paying for access, which we can withhold content and demand today. On page 28, you'll see the transparency and disclosure requirements about what is received and then um, that has to be made public and then how that money is spent. Leading into the markup tomorrow, that's going to be made more made strength, uh, stronger to require that the disclosures be about not only how you spent it, but how you spent it on specific journalists, that the agreements be made public, that each individual publisher and broadcaster identify how much they received and again, how much they spent it. And that's publicly with a public disclosure, which was pre previously private of what would be posted only with the FTC and the DOJ. So that's actually been adjusted to make the disclosures even more, even more strong. We have nothing to hide. Um, so um, let me just interject on the on the transparency side of things, because I think that's one of the things that a lot of these bills have been criticized about is, you know, in Australia, who is benefiting? How much are these deals? We had mm -hmm. to have, you know, Bill went there to like do some investigative reporting about what exactly there was. There was this great um, article in Press Forward, and I'll try to post it when I'm not talking, um, that, you know, did that investigation. And, and so it's good to see that there's recognition that this type of information needs to be public. And I do hope that we'll see also, the news industry playing by the same rules that it, you know, that it requests from the platforms, which is greater transparency and so making that publicly available. Um, but I guess, you know, just before we go into too much detail on this particular bill, I would ask, you know, Matthew, uh, Matt, you know, so, there have been some updates to this. You heard some of Danielle's response and, and I think around the transparency, these efforts to focus it on smaller media you know, does this alleviate some of the concerns? And I think to Julia's point, like, is this going to solve the problem? No. Um, is it going to harm the problem any more than where we are right now? I guess I'm kind of falling personally on the side of like, probably not, might as well try it. And I guess, Matt, I'd be interested in, in your thoughts, given some of the revisions that Danielle mentioned that is, you know, responding to some of the critiques that you raised. Yeah, and I'm glad to hear that the transparency, um, you know, aspects of the bill <clears throat> will be enhanced if if that occurs. Then I think that will be a great thing. Um, as far as willingly providing content, we can agree to disagree. Um, I can I can prevent anyone from taking my content on on the internet quite easily. Um, and to say on the one hand that you're forced to give it to the platforms, and so then therefore they should pay for it. This bill also requires platforms. It's a must carry provision effectively. So a platform cannot say, I don't want to carry your content because I don't want to pay for it. So those, it, it, it feels to me as though those things are all trying to do multiple things at the same time. Did you want to respond? To I, I would love to, thank you. I really sure, appreciate okay. that. Um, 
Um, actually, there's nothing in the bill that requires uh, carriage. We would have loved that. We we pushed for that. There's actually nothing in the bill that re requires carriage of our content. Um, Which is does it not say that you can't refuse uh, to, to host the content? That a platform <laughs> cannot refuse to host the content? Correct. As a way of not paying. Okay. Correct. Is, you can't think, real quick. You can't retaliate if somebody asks you for payment by then just then taking it down for that specific reason, which has to be proven in court. So, but you don't have to carry. So that it. is a must carry provision. No. So you do not have to carry the content. Let's okay. agree to disagree on the okay. how we interpret that. That's ultimately let going me, to be something the courts. Yeah. Let me. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Let me go on to the the other things you mentioned. I'm glad, um, Julia stepped back a little bit to talk about the, the sort of structure of the industry. Um, in particular, I guess one of my problems with these types of legislation is I think they're going at the problem the wrong way. If, if the problem is the advertising industry, then bills should attack that directly. If the problem is that advertising has moved to platforms and away from journalism, and we believe that that's a structural inequity, then we should solve that problem. We shouldn't sort of use this Rube Goldberg style device where we make claims about what content, whether it's willingly carried or not, and how much the platforms should pay and come up with magical numbers about how much value they generate. If we think advertising is the problem and particularly surveillance advertising, then we should just tax it. And then we should take those funds and we should distribute them to journalism. Um, thank you, Matt. And I think, you know, you you're, you rightly pointed out, and Julia, you made this point at the beginning, you know, defining the problem is going to uh, shape the solution. So let's stick on the advertising um, issue for a moment and move away from, you know, this, the news mar media bargaining approach. One of the most contentious things that will have to be decided um, if there is an effort to reallocate tax dollars is how to define journalism. So in Canada, for example, they already have a mechanism to um, allocate uh, citizen tax funds to journalism. They've, they've come up with a process. Julia, I'd be interested to you uh, to hear from you on, you know, if we think that the primary problem is advertising and, and as you suggested, get these companies to pay their money and then you can reallocate um, some of those taxes. What are the challenges about defining journalism? How would you maybe go about approaching that? You know, again, having worked in many different types of journalism organizations, how would how would we begin to think about defining where those benefits would go? That's such a good question. And it's a weird thing about journalism. It's, um, you know, unlike lawyers or doctors, we don't have a professional association or any sort of credentialing system, even one that is just pure credentialing. Um, and so we have chosen to allow basically anyone to call themselves a journalist. And that is something that is now um, causing problems because there are definitely um, different standards out there, right? It, it's very hard for someone like me who has spent their whole life being like, I would never write a story without going to the per the target of the story, offering them extensive opportunities to comment. If there's data, sharing the data, I share code with people. Like my process is so, um, so much about fairness. And then there are journalists out there who do hit and run pieces and there are people who do fake journalism, right? They just write fake things and, and their sites look kind of like news. And so we're in a weird place where it's sort of the only police right now for who's a journalist or not are like, are, are actually like private um, groups like NewsGuard or, you know, Snopes or something. And so, and that's kind of hit and run, right? Like sometimes um, they might label something one way or the other way and there's no and so I think that they would be good if journalists could get together and set an extremely low bar for what uh, journalism should be and I know Matt Matthew's going to disagree with me but all journalists oh, no. just your phrase journalists get together and decide something that's what I was laughing at <laughs> that I mean, almost look, never happens. I know but I mean I do feel like if the bar could be something really low like um has your domain been um, identified as, uh, you know, on Snopes as 
um, containing lies. Like maybe there's something low enough that we could do because I agree that it is really hard for the platforms for interest. Like for instance, basically, you know, I think that the tech companies would actually prefer if there was a list that they could use because they have to make these decisions right now and they use all sorts of algorithms and guesses to try to figure out what's credible news and what's not credible news. And it's a really hard problem and they always get it wrong and then we yell at them, but of course we don't have a solution to offer. And so I think this is one of the key problems of this and I would be interested to know if it's been solved. It sounds like you're saying it has been solved maybe in other places. But, yeah, I, I don't uh, know if it's been solved, but Matt, do you want to weigh in on kind of the Canadian I, I was, situation? Yeah, I was just going to say Canada has tried the allow people to dedicate a certain proportion of their taxes to media outlets, which is a great effort, I think, and amounts to a tiny drop in a massive ocean. So not that it's not good, but is it going to change anyone's life? No. Um, the fund that was mandated um, has a group of journalists and media industry types who decide where that funding goes, which is hugely controversial. So, um, I mean, everyone has complained from every aspect of it that it's got too many, you know, representatives from major publishers who already get a lot of money. Um, that's one of the major criticisms or they're not directing enough of it to local journalism more. And so obviously any effort like that is going to get criticism. You could argue at least there's some money going towards journalism. Um, I mean, there has been a lot of discussion about how effectively this money comes from the government. So you're being paid by the government to do journalism, which is just a massively conflicted place to be. Even if that money isn't life-changing money, you're still being paid by the government um, who you're theoretically reporting on, so. But isn't it just as conflicting to get money from Google and Facebook, which most newsrooms are getting right now, you know? And so that right. is like, that is the challenge I think is if right. you- if Who you do you say, get the money from? Wait, because the problem is Google and Facebook are providing a lot of money to a lot of newsrooms. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, when I was at ProPublica, for instance, I, um, I had to wall myself off from the entire election coverage because it was funded by Google News and I mm -hmm. literally covered Google and and so I would try not to, I like had to try to set up my own like weird Chinese wall in the newsroom and that was really awkward and to be honest like it wouldn't have mattered to me at all if there had been some sort of like government funding there because it would have been too amorphous right like even if the US government sent some money it doesn't mean it would affect my ability to do some coverage of some agency or whatever because it's just it's not as clear as just the tech company money and i think this is something that journalists mm -hmm. journalism needs to confront basically pick your poison like i'm not saying one is right but you have to choose right and a lot of people have this default feeling that government funding is terrible and that corporate funding is fine and i think we need to re-examine that because government funding comes from the people and we represent the people. And so in some ways it might be cleaner money because all money is dirty. So you just pick. <laughs> but yeah. I don't but it could do I've yeah. seen the opposite. So I've got to, I've, I hate to say, it, but I got to totally disagree only because I've watched the companies who accept the money from these grant programs and GNI and so forth. And I, and I've, I've firsthand seen how fearful they are when it's not pursuant to a legal right to be compensated for your con content, like other industries, every other industry who creates content, and you have to wait for the benevolence and the help of somebody to give you a bailout. And I'm not talking about, I'm not even talking about what people colloquially call the uh, tax, news tax that was going through Congress or what Canada did, which we were very supportive of and were supportive of all these payment mechanisms, including, you know, nonprofit models and so forth. But I, I do have to agree with Julia's last point about um, or disagree with her about the um, payment from the platforms, because when it's not pursuant to a legal right, I've watched newspapers be very worried about that going away. And when it's when it's a, uh, out of the benevolence or out of the goodness of the heart of the platforms, they're very reluctant to um, to, you know, want to assert their rights or whatever you might uh, do. If you otherwise had the ability, if not for the stronghold that you have, because you're being funded through these grant programs, and I've seen them firsthand. And it is going away. I mean, Facebook is talking about dropping funding 
the funding it gives to meat outlets completely. They sure are, because they don't have to. And I would Google if you had shareholders and you could get something for free. And it does seem like, I mean, I think ultimately Julia is saying the same thing, which is, you know, getting money from platforms is not necessarily any better or worse than getting it from any other entity that is a major focus of journalistic coverage. Um, and, you know, there's this, this question from David Clinch about if we don't ask, so, so on the one hand, you know, asking publishers, asking big tech um, to pay publishers, create some sort of wall between you know, perhaps feeling like you're going to be retaliated for them taking back your grant money because it's a legal requirement. Um, so maybe that adds some distance, similar to kind of what Julia, you were saying about taxation, you know, it's so filtered. And in the United States, where there is far less media capture than say in other countries, ranging from Hungary to Egypt, where you would be really concerned about how that tax money um, might be used, does that alleviate some of the concerns and how, you know, what are the alternatives, David's asking, you know, what are the alternatives, mechanisms for platforms to support news? And I guess I want to just kind of go down the line while well, you're in a line on my screen um, and ask, you know, just for your, your take, should platforms be responsible for supporting the news, whether that's mandated through law or through their you know, personal generosity, um, or should that just be something the news industry figures out on its own? Matt, Julia, then Danielle. Yeah, I fundamentally don't think uh, Google or Facebook has any moral or ethical or legal duty to support journalism. Um, I, I would like them to, and I think they would benefit in a whole bunch of ways from doing it. And I think the main, the main reason why we look to them is because they have a lot of money and, uh, and they're a big distributor. So the combination of those two things makes them an easy target for us to compel them to pay us. But I think we should be, I think if we are going to try and get them to pay for journalism, we should just tax them, just tax them based on their surveillance advertising model or based on their duopoly or monopsony or however you want to describe it, and then figure out a way to use that tax revenue um, to support journalism the same way people did when TV was brand new or radio or just um, come up with a structure that effectively treats media and journalism as a public benefit and then finds funding for that public benefit. Great. Thanks, Matt. What about you, Julia? What do you think? Well, this is extremely rare, but I'm in violent agreement with Matthew. Um, <laughs> we don't usually agree on things, but um, I, uh, I, I don't think the platforms have any obligation. Private companies don't have an obligation, but we as citizens of a democracy have an obligation to, um, to make our the corporations pay what they need to support society, right? And so um, we should tax all corporations um, more than we do in the United States. And we should use that money to support all sorts of benefits and journalism is one of them. And so um, I, I think it is very difficult, like Danielle was saying, for newsrooms to be living off of a grant from a platform. They get so worried about losing that money. It does I know no one will ever be able to prove it, but I know as a journalist that it does cause you to self-censor when you know that your financial future is on the line. And so I don't think a solution that relies on that is, is a good one. And so, um, so I, I agree with Matthew that if we want this to happen, I think we have to find a way that doesn't involve um, these direct transfers. And Danielle, I'm going to say you probably disagree, but you know, where do you come down on this in an, in an ideal world? Well, I think words are important. And I, what I heard um, Matt say was there's a, there's not a, a moral, ethical, or legal duty to support journalism. If you can believe it, I totally agree with that. Um, however, there is a legal authority that we have to demand the payment for the revenue they receive from our content. And there's also a legal duty because of antitrust laws that the government step in when there's a broken marketplace and that we can't assert our rights. So do I think out of the benevolence and moral or ethical or legal or otherwise that they should support 
us? No, but we do have the legal ability to have them pay us for what they're getting from us. And what about, I mean, what about the direct subsidies or grants as direct support from big tech to journalism? What do you, do you think that's, I mean, Danielle, just, you know, your quick take on that, is that part of the solution or is it better to look for other approaches that are maybe less prone to capture and, and influence? Well, I love the nonprofit model. Um, and when Tom Rosen still used to be here at um, API, we would talk a lot about it, but unfortunately it doesn't, um, it's 96% of a shortfall. Actually, if you, if you round up all of the philanthropic giving, it's just, it's like, it's, it's pennies. It's not what's necessary. So as much as I love that model, it's, it's not going to cut it. Um, and, and again, I, I think that we have the ability to ask for what we're owed in, in any transaction, you know, we have a lot of pride in our industry, and I and I also really um, appreciate that. Um, but we are also entitled to. We are also a business in many respects, and we get to demand um, payment for what our valuable content that we make. And I think that that's okay to ask for it. Can I add something here, which is um, that I'm also in agreement with Danielle in the sense that, like, so much of um, my work has been about platform self-preferencing, right? They are abusing their monopoly power to extend it into new areas and dominate beyond where their initial monopoly was. And so um, at the markup, we did two big investigations about platform self-preferencing. Google um, puts at the top of the page, we measured the search results and saw how much of the top of the page was taken up by Google's own properties and it was 40% of the page and if you looked at just the top part that shows up on the before you scroll down the page it was actually 60%. Same thing with Amazon, we looked at how often they put their own products at the top of search results and it was again far beyond what um what should have been the case. So we did an interesting sort of statistical analysis, which showed that the most predictive factor to get to the top of Amazon search results by a factor of eight to one is being an Amazon brand, right? It, eight times more likely than having most popular reviews, et cetera. So these, we ha I have spent much of my career trying to show how these platforms actually abuse their monopoly power. And so I am in very much in agreement with Danielle that that has to be reined in. Right, and that has to be reined in across all different ways. And one of the ways is it is also hurting journalism. That um, that's such a great point, Julia. And I and I want to just again thank you for the journalism that you guys are doing at the markup because, you know, not only have platforms completely shifted the economic model and influenced you know the economy in so many ways, but they've also created entirely new beats and new issues that need to be covered. And therefore, they've also taken resources in that way from journalism. You know, they are um, the attention that these platforms need uh, have given rise to entirely new beats, new types of people that you need to hire to make sense of them or to investigate them or to use them. Um, so I think that's that's really relevant. Um, I want to acknowledge that a lot of this conversation is very kind of U.S. North America focused. It is about kind of our economy here. If we're talking about taxing big tech in the U.S., we're talking about supporting U.S. journalism. I don't want to dismiss the global impacts, but, you know, we are kind of focused on the U.S. impact here. And I just will invite folks um, to join a, another discussion that will have that global perspective. But I want to return now to the question around kind of defining beneficiaries and while the, I think while the issue around who, who individuals, who is and who isn't a journalist is important, that's often less of an issue um, with some of the subsidies or taxation or then, you know, ways that news organizations are going to benefit because ultimately it's de defining the news organization. So for the most part, these aren't like, you know, going to be for citizen journalists doing occasional observation online. So if we're thinking about how to define you know, a journalistic beneficiary of a tax break or a news media bargaining code um, or of a subsidy. How do you think that we can do that with without a subsidizing, um, you know, uh, other firms like um, uh, venture capitalist firms that are buying up news media? 
um, you know, and turning them into profit centers, which is seems funny right now, um, given the way the industry is. But how do you avoid kind of turning this into a windfall for shareholders of private corporations or venture capitalists and actually get to the news organizations that need support while also recognizing big news organizations like the New York Times or, um, you know, the Guardian do really important reporting. Like if we can hone in on this idea of, of how you make that decision and who should make it. And I would, I would, point then to a comment from Sarah Wiley about, she notes, uh, Sarah notes that sev several states have already defined journalism for reporters privilege. Similarly, the Senate press gallery decides which news organizations get a spot in there. The government has no role in that, but the, you know, journalists themselves decide. The White House decides who gets a spot there and you know in collaboration with the White House Correspondents Association. So, anyways, yeah, let's let's get your thoughts on how can this decision be made on who gets to benefit. Julia, let's start with you. Um, yeah, I think this is a really important question, and I think that um, all the or all the examples you gave actually point to the most successful way to do this is peer credentialing, right? This is how universities credential as well. They do not ask the government to say who is uh, a legitimate learning institution. They have a peer credentialing system. And I think the one thing that journalists are legitimately afraid of is setting up a credentialing system that the government could dole out and deny access to people who they dislike their coverage of, right? And we certainly saw have seen that in uh, the Trump administration denying certain reporters access to press conferences, et cetera. That is a common problem in, so, whatever system is set up has to avoid that, right? And that's why a peer led system is I think the way to go. Of course, the devil is in the details and they're the bigger organization